Hi. This week, we're still talking about Mendelian genetics, and we're still talking about things that happen when you have a single gene controlling a trait, but we're going to talk about some more possibilities of outcomes that we can see from a cross. So after today, you should be able to analyze the results of a cross to determine the degree of dominance that an allele shows. If you are maybe observing interactions between more than two alleles of a single gene, and Notice if there is a recessive lethal allele present. So far in this class, we've only talked about dominance as complete dominance. That is, we have said that there are situations where, let's say, there is a big R allele that confers a red flower color, and there's a little r allele that confers the white flower color. Well, we've seen situations like this, where the heterozygous individual shows the phenotype of one of the parents. In this case, this heterozygous individual shows the phenotype of the big R, big R parent. Therefore, we would say that the big R allele is completely dominant to the little r allele. In reality, there are more possibilities. For example, there is incomplete dominance. Here, you might see a situation where we have a big R, big R parent with red flowers, um, a little r, little r parent with white flowers, but their heterozygous offspring does not have the exact same phenotype as either one of the parents. Instead, the phenotype is somewhere in the middle, and this is called incomplete dominance. The phenotype of the heterozygous individual doesn't completely match the phenotype of either one of the parents. It's something a little bit different, in this case, pink. You can also have a situation of codominance. In this case, we again have a big R, big R parent with red flowers, a little r, little r, parent with white flowers and their offspring, um, it definitely is not just red like one parent or just white like one parent. It's also not something totally different like a new color. It's just mottled or spotted. That is, you can see the phenotype of both parents in the heterozygous offspring, and we would call this codominance. And just to put this all in one slide, in all of these situations, these heterozygous offspring have the same genotype. Of course, we could be diff talking about different genes between these different individuals, but they are heterozygous for a gene that determines the phenotype that we're talking about in each respective case. But because this was a situation of complete dominance, we saw that the heterozygous offspring matched the phenotype of one of the parents. This was a case of incomplete dominance. We saw that the heterozygous offspring did not match either parent. And this was a case of codominance, in which case the heterozygous offspring matched both parents. We can observe all of these possibilities in a Punnett square. Here I've made a very uh, sim a simple case of the homozygous big R, big R parent that shows a red phenotype, homozygous little r, little r parent that shows a white phenotype. Here I have completed a Punnett square, and you see that all of their offspring would be heterozygous. And in this case, I have indicated the phenotype of the offspring as the color of the square, and we said they're all red. So in this case, if I were answering this question on an exam, what is the degree of dominance here? I would say that the big R allele is completely dominant to the little r allele. Completely dominant. Again, I say that because the, the phenotype that I observe in the heterozygous offspring completely matches one of the parents. Here, I have the same cross between the big R, big R, little r, little r individual, but now in the heterozygous offspring, I observe a pink phenotype. So what would I say is the degree of dominance? Here, I might say that I see incomplete dominance between the big R allele and the little r allele. And finally, what if I see a situation like this? Again, same parents, same genotype, same phenotypes, but in the offspring, I saw a modeled or spotted or somehow observed the phenotypes of both parents, not in any sort of blended or intermediate phenotype, but I do see both of them. Well, here I would say that the big R and little r alleles are co-dominant. They are both expressed in the offspring. Why does this happen? Why are some alleles dominant over other alleles? Well, let's go back to one example that we've been using this semester, which is the round and wrinkled phenotype in peas, which we have been discussing as a case of complete dominance. That is, 
Um, even the heterozygous P's that are big R, little r show the round phenotype. And it's only the little r, little r um, genotypes that show the wrinkled phenotype. So it's helpful now to start to think about what is this R? Well, this R is a locus in this genome or a gene that, um, and specifically it's a gene that encodes an enzyme that converts this unbranched starch to a branched starch. And the presence of branched starch is going to make this round shape. And the absence of branched starch is going to make this wrinkled shape. So the big R allele is an allele that encodes an active functional version of this enzyme. So peas that have either two copies of the big R allele or even just one copy of the big R allele, they do have this functional active enzyme. They do undergo this conversion of unbranched to branched starch and they have the round phenotype. The little r allele is a non-functional version of this, of this protein. It's an inactive enzyme. So if this P has two copies of the little r allele, that means they have two copies of an in, inactive enzyme, a, a product that doesn't work. They can't do this conversion process at all. There will be no branch starch. So in other words, the big R and big, big R, big R, and big R little r genotypes, there is branch starch present which is enough to confer the round phenotype. Little r, little r, there is no branch starch that confers the wrinkled phenotype. In a case of incomplete dominance, you might have a situation like this, where in this case, the R gene encodes an enzyme that makes this red pigment. So in this case, we have the big R, big R genotype means you're making lots of red pigment. You have two, two copies, of that gene in your genome that are functional that can make this red pig pigment. The heterozygous individuals only have one functional copy. The little r allele um, does not make this red pigment. So these heterozygous individuals can make some of the red pigment, but not as much as the big R, big R individuals. Therefore, they will look a lighter red or pink. And the little r, little r, um, these individuals have no functional copies of this enzyme that make the pigment. Therefore, they're not making any red pigment. They are appearing white. Now, to talk about codominance, I'm going to move away from the flower example. And remember, these are all just examples. There are many, many molecular explanations for relationships between alleles. I'm just offering these as a way to encourage you to think about what those mechanisms might be. So, um, to talk about codominance, I'm going to switch to talking about blood type in humans. So here we can see that there are three types of blood so far that I have in this chart. We have, um, there are people with type A blood, people with type B blood, and people with um, blood type AB. Now, this is conferred by the ABO gene, which is um, actually shown over here. The protein product that's encoded by that gene is an enzyme that adds sugars to these blood cells. So here, the, um, the A version of this gene, so which we call this gene with the letter I, so the IA allele, it adds the A-type sugar, which you see here as magenta circles. The B allele, the IB allele, adds the B sugar, which is shown here by these turquoise diamonds. And in the heterozygous individuals, that is, when you have genotype IAIB, both enzymes are present, so you have both sugar types on your blood cells. Or in other words, this is a case of codominance. The phenotype of a heterozygous individual reflects both of the phenotypes that are, are present in the homozygous individuals. Um, now, this is, I like this example because it brings us to an important point that genes can have more than two alleles. So um, in this case, we see that there are still the IA and IB alleles, and these um, are going to affect the type of sugar that's added to a blood cell. But there's also a little i allele, and this is a non-functional sugar transferring enzyme. So it's like the little r allele in peas where it's just a copy of this enzyme that doesn't work at all. So what you end up getting um, if individuals are genotype little i, oops, oops, sorry, lost my pen, 
little I, little I, then they end up being group O blood, which is that they do not have sugars on their blood cells at all. So here, let's think about all of the possible genotypes that confer each of these phenotypes. So for blood type A, I can be um, homozygous for the A allele. For blood type B, I can be homozygous for the B allele. And we already saw with AB, that is a person who is heterozygous for the A and B alleles. And like we wrote here, um, group O, um, the only way to be group O is that you don't have any functional copy of this uh, sugar transferring enzyme. So your genotype is little i, little i. Or in other words, the little i allele is completely recessive to both the IA and IB alleles. And the IA and IB alleles are co-dominant to each other. Um, but here, since we just introduced this point of the little i allele is recessive to the um, IA and IB alleles, we can notice that you can also have an individual with type A blood who is IA little i. And you can also have an individual with type B blood who is IB little i, right? Because there's still a copy of the enzyme that adds the A sugar or the B sugar in these individuals. Now let's expand on that and work through an example problem. So you might want to pause and try to answer this question yourself. But if I say that there's a person with blood type A and a person with blood type B, they produce a child with blood type O, what are the genotypes of the parents at this ABO gene? Maybe pause and think about it. And we could see here um, that the solution is shown in this Punnett square. I started thinking about this by thinking that I know the genotype of a child with blood type O must be little i, little i. I know the genotype of a parent with blood type A must be I, A, something. I know the genotype of a parent with type B blood must be I, B, something. Now the question is, where did this child get the little i alleles? Well, they must have gotten one from each parent. Therefore, this something in each case must be a little i. And the Punnett square hopefully demonstrates um, how that would be and the proportion of offspring that you could expect from these parents with the other blood types. The last topic that I wanna bring up is that of pleiotropy, which is that a single gene can affect unrelated phenotypes. And this is going to show up in your Punnett square. And I'm going to use this example of mice with different colors of fur, which is controlled by the agouti gene. Now in these mice, the wild type allele of the agouti gene, that is the version of the gene that um, is typically found in natural populations and is opposed to what we would think of as a mutant version of the gene. So the wild type, big A, big A, results in black fur. There is a mutant copy of, of this gene, a mutant version, which we call AY. Um, and we know that in, in, in heterozygous um, mice that are AYA, they have yellow fur. Now, there's some, some important facts that I could take away from this. The first being that because I know that the genotype of this mouse is big A, big A, and the genotype of this mouse is AYA. Here, I know that AY is dominant to A, right? Because I observe the um, phenotype associated with this yellow color, even in the heterozygous individual. So now taking that information, let's work through a problem where now I'm going to make many crosses between these heterozygous individuals. And I'm going to tell you that I repeatedly observe a two to one ratio of yellow to black fur in the progeny. So how could this be true? So what I'm expecting when I set up a cross between heterozygous individuals, so these mice with the yellow fur that I know are YAY, so I set up my Punnett square here. I'm expecting to see um, a, a one to two to one genotype ratio of the um, homozygous YA 
the heterozygote and the homozygous Y. And based on what I know from the previous slide, that the YA allele appears to be dominant to the Y allele, this should result in a 3 to 1 phenotype ratio of yellow to black. But I explained in the problem that it, that is not what we saw. We saw a 2 to 1 ratio of yellow to black. So maybe you could pause the video here and think about what are the ways that you could see a 2 to 1 ratio of yellow to black given the Punnett square that's in front of you right now. And the solution is that what if you never observed these mice at all? You never observed the possibility of having this um, homozygous YA allele. And in fact, that is what happens because this allele um, that confers the, the yellow coat color also causes other effects in the, in the mouse that is, it is pleiotropic. It has other effects besides just coat color. And one of those is mortality at a very early stage of development, such that you would never even see those pups being born. So when you take those um, homozygous YAYA mice out of the possibilities of uh, progeny that you could observe, you end up seeing a two to one ratio of the yellow to black, where all of the yellow uh, mice are heterozygous. I'm going to stop there, and next we'll start to think about what happens when we have multiple genes interacting with each other.